quite extraordinary to reflect on the mercies of God to us. Not just over the past year, but over our entire history. God has helped us. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. amen. I'd like to take a moment before we start uh, just to thank uh, Martin and Ramona for those wonderful prophetic words this morning. Thank you for seeking the Lord. Thank you for listening to the Holy Spirit. Thank you for delivering what he gave you uh, faithfully to us. Uh, so edifying, so encouraging. And I also want to take a moment just to thank uh, our intercessors. I know that uh, there's a group of people who gather uh, before this service week after week to pray, to cry out to God, to meet us in the worship, in the preached word, in all the activities that are happening through the course of the week. Uh, brothers and sisters, those of you who pray before this service and who, who find yourselves in your own private prayer closets asking God to meet us, thank you for praying. Now, if you would open to Matthew chapter 6, we want to look at the Lord's Prayer this morning. So the title of the sermon is The New Year and the Lord's Prayer. The New Year and the Lord's Prayer. I'd like to begin reading at verse 5. I think the cut line in your Bible probably says the Lord's Prayer right above verse 5, and that's where we will begin. This is God's holy word. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, when you pray, go into your inner room and shut the door and pray to your Father who sees in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. And then Jesus immediately goes back to to, to explain probably the, the most amazing statement that's made in that prayer about us being forgiven as we forgive. He said, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And this quite extraordinarily, but if you do not forgive others, their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
And let's continue reading the next section. And when you fast, so he talked about when you pray. Now he's talking about when you fast. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who sees in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Uh, and before I even begin, I'd like to direct your attention to something that's not in my notes. But you can see that when, he, when the Lord Jesus talks about prayer, he says, your Father will reward you. And when he talks about fasting, he says, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Anybody want a reward? Anybody want a reward from the Father? I want a reward. Well, let us pray and let us fast. We have a long-standing tradition at Covenant Fellowship of setting apart the first week of January for prayer and fasting. We do this to acknowledge at the beginning of each year our utter dependence upon God. Though we may labor in the fields of the world, only God can give a harvest. Though some of us will plant and others will sow, others will water, only God can give the growth. So at the start of each year, we ask the Lord of the harvest to give us a harvest. We ask him to cause the seed planted and watered to grow and bear much fruit. We do that because we, we know that only the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit can take those who are dead in their sins and make them into a new creation. We know that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. We know that all the glorious things that we long for in the year ahead cannot and will not happen apart from the activity of God the Holy Spirit. They cannot and will not happen if divine power and divine righteousness and divine blessing are not poured out from above. And what is more, we know that we've been commanded to ask. To ask for the Holy Spirit. For our Savior himself said, I tell you. Now this is the Savior talking. He's talking to us. I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? It's clear from the context of that passage in Luke 11, where Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer. We, we read the, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew. It's also recorded in Luke with some Slight differences. Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer and then he immediately followed that with the parable of the persistent friend who wanted to give bread to his guest, had no bread, went to his friend, to his neighbor, asked him for bread, kept asking. 
And Jesus commended that persistence. It's very clear from the context that Jesus wants us to ask the Father to give us the Holy Spirit that we might take the bread of life to others. We Christians are meant to be devoted not only to the breaking of bread when we gather here, not only to fellowship with one another, we're meant to be devoted to prayer, devoted to asking God with importunity, with persistence again and again, to move among us in the world for his glory. You will have noticed in Matthew 5, after giving his disciples the Lord's Prayer, after expounding on the part about forgiveness, Jesus immediately taught on the practice of fasting when you fast. Some people came up to Jesus and said, hey, why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples do? Do you remember what Jesus said? When the bridegroom is gone, they will fast. The scriptures call us to pray and to fast. Now, I've been asked by Jared to teach from the Lord's Prayer to prepare our hearts and minds for our week of prayer and fasting. So let's dive right in. The Lord's Prayer consists of three parts. There is a preface, and then there are six petitions, six requests that we make of God, and then a conclusion. The preface deals with the matter of address. It makes it clear who we pray to. To whom do we pray? And the answer is that we pray to God, and we pray to God alone. Normally to our Father in heaven. Now if that raises questions for you, what about praying to saints? What about praying to Jesus? What about praying to the Holy Spirit? Are those things permitted? Let me encourage you to listen to the recordings of our Sunday school class on the Lord's Prayer, which happened this past fall, where we go into detail on those questions. So there's the preface, which deals with the matter of address. Then there are the first three petitions. There's six petitions altogether. And they divide evenly into, into, into the first three and the second three. The first three petitions are hallowed be thy name, or your name, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Those first three petitions concern God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will. The second three petitions... Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses or our debts or our sins as we forgive. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. You can see there's a shift in focus. Thy name, thy kingdom, thy will, and then our need for provision, our need for forgiveness, and our need for help in the battle against sin. And then there's the conclusion, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, in our reading this morning, you'll notice that those words are put in the margin of your Bibles. They are not in the text that we read. And the reason that the traditional conclusion is in the margin was covered in detail in a Sunday school class that we did not long ago on the Lord's Prayer, and you can listen for the answers there. Now, there's much to learn from every part of the Lord's Prayer, but this morning, in the interest of time, we'll restrict ourselves to the first three petitions. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, and we'll, we'll focus our attention on on those three. The first petition is hallowed be thy name or hallowed be your name. Now that first word in this first petition may not be entirely clear to us. Hallowed is a bit of an archaic word that is seldom used today. Probably the most familiar usage of that term to, to us would have been in Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address which many of us learned or at least read in school. In that speech, President Lincoln said, 
as he dedicated the graveyard uh, to those fallen in the great battle of Gettysburg, he said in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have hallowed it far above our poor power to add or detract. Now, Lincoln, in, in, in that part of the Gettysburg Address, actually helps us understand the word. To hallow something, to hallow that ground, means, means to sanctify it, to set it apart, to make it holy, or to consecrate it. And in the Lord's Prayer, the verb to hallow, hallowed be thy name, hallow thy name. It's, it's a verb and it's in the imperative voice or mood, which means that this petition is an insistent request. It's an imperative. When we pray, hallowed be thy name, or holy be your name, we're making an insistent request that something be done. R. Scott Clark says the first petition in the Lord's Prayer is that God Himself, who is holy, who is morally pure and righteous, should act so that His name should come to be regarded as holy. When we pray, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be your name, we are praying, in effect, our Father in heaven, do something about the honor of your name. Act for the honor and the glory of your name. Move that your name may be set apart and consecrated and glorified. Hallowed be thy name. Names connect very intimately to persons. God's name is closely connected to God himself, just like your name is connected to you. So, hallowed be your name then becomes an insistent request that God would move in such a way that every heart and every tongue in every place would honor him and reverence him and praise him for who he is. For who he's revealed himself to be in creation and in redemption. This first petition in the Lord's Prayer is the first petition for good reason. It shows us what ought to be our very first concern in prayer. It reveals the burden that should permeate all of our praying, which is an inner longing for the glory of God and the praise of His name. It bothers us that God's name is not revered and regarded as holy. It bothers us that His person is not honored and glorified. And that burden is to animate and permeate all of our praying. An inner longing for the glory of God and the praise of His name. The first petition is meant to inform all of our praying so that when we get, for instance, to the part about our daily bread, our need for provision, Really, the, the, what should be in our hearts and our minds is, O oh Lord, give us our daily bread that we might glorify your name. O oh Lord, forgive us our trespasses for the glory and the honor of your name. O oh Lord, deliver us from evil that our lives would magnify you and glorify your name and not bring dishonor to you or to your name. Deliver us from evil. So John Piper says, When Jesus made the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, he was showing us that the touchstone of all believing prayer is zeal for the glory of God. Now that makes perfect sense because we know that the chief end of man is what? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. 
He was showing us that the touchstone of all believing prayer is zeal for God's glory. Jesus taught us that, first and foremost, we should ask God to make sure He is seen and revered as great. We should want this and love this above all. That's one of the things I love about John Piper. You can't listen to him preach anything or write anything without this burden for the glory and the honor of God's name coming through. That should be an example to us all. So as we pray in our homes, as we pray in our cars, as we pray in church this week, let zeal for God's glory energize and animate our praying so that all of our prayers, whether for the bridge class or for the youth of our church or for our families, have the honor of His name in view. For example, Lord, protect our sons and our daughters. Lord, show them mercy and loving kindness. Lord, reveal Yourself to them. But we don't end there. That your name might be exalted and glorified in them and through them. Do something for the honor of your name in and through our sons and daughters. The primary burden that should animate my praying ought not be my happiness in my family's well-being. It ought not be my joy in the growth of our church. It ought not be my comfort in life. The great burden and the great end for which I should long for and pray should be the great hallowing of His name. Have you ever noticed that the universal inclination in both pagan prayer and Christian prayer is to pray in a way that is self-focused, self-concerned, or even self-exalting. So much praying is in effect, Lord, act to bless me. Such praying is not evil. It's good as far as it goes. But it so often reflects a disordered priority. The priority in prayer is not, Lord, act to bless me. The priority is, Lord, act so that everyone everywhere blesses you. Move, O oh Lord, that your name may be hallowed. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The second petition Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come, or your kingdom come. Now here in the 21st century, again, we don't have an intuitive sense of what that means. I bet a lot of us have prayed thy kingdom come without really a clear idea of what we're praying for. We don't have an intuitive sense for it. Some nations in our world are still called kingdoms. You have the United Kingdom. Some nations still have kings, but those kings are most often ceremonial figureheads and not mighty kings who rule with executive, legislative, and judicial authority, concentrated in a single person. We don't live in a world of royal potentates, of good kings and bad kings, of kings and their kingdoms. And ever since our nation declared independence from the British clown, crown, not clown, <laughs> I read Andy's book, and that whole spirit of the revolution has come upon me. No. <laughs> Ever since our nation declared independence from the British crown, the very notion of kings and kingdoms ruffles our sensibilities as Americans. Because we've come to value a government of separated powers of, for, and by the people, not a king. But to understand how Jesus wants us to pray, we need to think about what a king is. Because the universe is not governed by the people. It's governed by the Creator. The universe is governed by the Maker of heaven and earth. It's governed by God Almighty. 
And he has made his son the second person of the Trinity, the man, Christ Jesus, the unsurpassed King of Kings. Long before Jesus was born, Daniel prophesied that a great king was coming. And speaking in the past tense of future events, Daniel spoke of one like the Son of Man. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. His kingdom will not be like any other. It will rule over all. His kingdom will not be restricted geographically. It will extend to all peoples and all nations. His kingdom will not be restricted to a certain period of history. It will have an everlasting dominion. It will never pass away and it will never be destroyed. When the angel Gabriel visited a little peasant girl in Nazareth, not far from the Sea of Galilee, Gabriel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. The angels announced his coming, treating him like royalty. When Jesus, the great Son of Man, the great Son of the Most High, began his ministry, he announced the arrival of the kingdom of God. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And one of the many evidences of the arrival of the kingdom of God of God in Jesus Christ himself was Jesus' kingly power and authority over Satan's kingdom. If it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, he said, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That raises a question. If the kingdom of God came already... When Christ came, why does Jesus instruct us to pray, Thy kingdom come? Isn't it here already? Why are we praying, Thy kingdom come? And the answer to that question is that many of the promises concerning the coming of the kingdom have not yet been fulfilled. Though the kingdom of God has come already, we still await the coming of the kingdom of God in fullness. While the kingdom has been inaugurated, it has not yet been consummated. For, again in the words of the king, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree. So in this prayer, thy kingdom come, we are seeking, to, we are praying for the growth of that metaphorical tree. We ask God to move so that the powers of the kingdom, so that the powers of the age to come, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the reigning king might break into this present evil age. We ask God that the, the righteousness of the age to come might come in greater measure to us and to the 8 billion people alive at this moment. We ask that the blessedness of the age to come might come to more and more people as they hear and believe the gospel. 
Thy kingdom come is an expansive heading under which we are called to make many, many petitions. One of the things you must realize about the Lord's Prayer is that it's not something simply to be uh, repeated and prayed liturgically. It's certainly that. It's perfectly fine to recite the Lord's Prayer in prayer. But every clause of the Lord's Prayer is a is a heading under which we pray many things. It's a model prayer. It covers the ground that we are to cover in prayer. It's not simply a mantra to be repeated. Thy kingdom come is an expansive heading under which we are called to make many, many petitions. J.I. Packer says this, he says, any request for a new display of God's sovereignty and grace, renewing the church, or converting sinners, or restraining evil, providing good in this world, is a further spelling out of thy kingdom come. If one asks where in the Lord's prayer does general intercession appear, the answer is here. Well, that brings us to the third petition. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Not just thy will be done, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. (laughs) Can you imagine how beautiful life on earth would be? How happy the whole world would be if everyone on earth did God's will as joyfully, as completely, and as immediately as it's done in heaven? Like, like just try and conceptualize that for a moment. The whole world, this beautiful earth that God has made, and everyone doing His will as it's done in heaven. That's what we're praying for. That's what we're praying for. It's glorious to consider that that is exactly what the arm of the Lord will accomplish. When we pray, may thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we pray into our great eschatological hope. Eschatological is just a big word that means concerning the end times. It's what we're hoping for in the consummation of the kingdom when Christ returns. We set our hope completely on the grace to be given to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we're praying into that hope You'll remember in the book of Revelation, what do the saints pray? They pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. They're praying into that hope. And we do as well. Every time we pray, your will be done on earth. Everywhere on earth as it is in heaven. But when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're also keenly aware that our wills are very often dull to or even opposed to the will of God. So here we, we also pray that God would help us live according to His will. I don't know about you, I can't pray, Lord, you know, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven without realizing that I'm on earth and I'm not always doing His will. Lord, help me to do your will as it's done in heaven. In this prayer, we pray that we would do the will of the Spirit and not the will of the flesh. And we pray that we would not shrink from doing all that he calls us to do. God has called every one of us to participate in in his Redemptive work on earth. He's given every one of us gifts and abilities and graces. Lord, help me not shrink back from doing your will by not employing those gifts and graces 
Lord, your will be done on earth in me as it is in heaven. And another aspect of Lord, thy will be done is the yielding to his providential will when, when the Lord may call us to suffer. And we find ourselves praying as our Savior did in Gethsemane, Lord, take this cup from me, but nevertheless, Father, not my will, but yours be done. In this prayer is also the, the, the prayer of resignation to his sovereign will. The Puritans very frequently prayed this way. I found a prayer by Richard uh, Alain, uh, who was one of the Puritan divines. He, he prayed this way. He said, O oh Lord, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put, to, put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and your disposal. Lord, your will be done in me. And may I graciously accept your providences concerning me and how you choose to use me. I yield, trusting your goodness. So let's summarize and close. Uh, the great objective in the first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer is, I think quite obviously you see by now, to make all our praying God-centered to direct our praying towards God's interests, which are the glory of His name, the coming of His kingdom, and the doing of His will. And we do that before we pray for our needs, for provision, for forgiveness, and for deliverance. Those are the priorities in our praying. And the beautiful irony is that when we pray for those things, we're praying for the very things that are in our best interest. <laughs> when our hearts are aligned to those first three petitions, that's the best thing in the world for us. For when for we, are, we are most happy, we are most blessed, we are most fruitful, when we hallow his name, when we receive his kingdom, and when we do his will. So, may these first three petitions, reflecting the priority in our praying, shape and influence our praying this week. Charles Spurgeon once asked his congregation, how could we look for a Pentecost, an outpouring of the Spirit upon us, if we never met with one accord in one place to wait upon the Lord. How could we look for a Pentecost if we never met with one accord in one place to wait upon the Lord? Brethren, we shall never see much change for the better in our churches in general till the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. The prayer meeting. On Friday night, January 6th, we have a church-wide prayer meeting. We invite you once again to come. It will be in this room. May God meet us powerfully in that meeting. And as we set aside time privately to go into our closets and pray with fasting. O Lord, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.